Well, good afternoon and welcome back to the Johnson Space Center for today's briefing to preview a pair of U.S. spacewalks coming up during this very busy time on the International Space Station for the Expedition 41 crew. With us today to provide a status on current station operations and to look at those spacewalks are Kenny Todd, the International Space Station Manager for Integration and Operations, Scott Stover, the NASA Flight Director for the International Space Station, Jacqueline Kage, the lead spacewalk officer for U.S. EVA 27, coming up on October 7, and Keith Johnson, the lead spacewalk officer for U.S. EVA 28, coming up on October 15th. And we'll start off with Kenny. Thanks, Rob, and uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'll, I'll uh, defer the conversation about the specifics of the EVAs to uh, uh, Scott and, and Keith and Jackie, but. From a big picture perspective, uh, I'll tell you things are going very well on board the space station. Um, as most of you know, last week uh, we had the arrival of, of 40S, um, which allowed us to increase our, our crew complement back up to three on the USOS uh, with the addition of Butch Wilmore. I'll tell you, Bill is, uh, or, or Butch is doing a great job. Uh, he's uh, pretty much got his space legs up under him now. He's, he's making contributions to to the team and doing a great job and so we're looking forward to having him aboard for the next uh, six months. Um, he, uh, he joined uh, Reed Wiseman and Alexander Gerst. Uh, those two guys have been doing a great job while, uh, while they've been down at a crew of, of three on the station and uh, it's good to, to have the, the crew back up to six again. Um, this crew of three on the USOS will be together for about a month. Uh, we'll plan to bring uh, Alexander and Reed home on November 10th. And uh, between now and then, they've got a, an awful lot of work to do. Um, just about a week ago, a little over a week ago, we birthed the uh, SpaceX Dragon uh, for the uh, third, uh, excuse me, the fourth of the commercial resupply flights that SpaceX is doing for us. Uh, that particular Dragon had uh, a large complement of science and payloads on it. And uh, these guys are off uh, knocking the science out and doing a great job and, uh, and uh, so far so good. Um, in the midst of all that, uh, we're planning for a couple of EVAs that you're going to hear the details about here shortly. Um, so, so we'll get these EVAs done, do the science on SpaceX, and then on or about the, the 21st of, of October, we'll plan to unberth the Dragon and uh, turn our sights towards hopefully a couple of more uh, uh, commercial uh, cargo resupply flights between now and the end of the year. So. Um, as I mentioned, in parallel to doing all the science on the SpaceX, uh, we're about to embark on uh, what will be um, a series of EVAs uh, starting next week that'll stretch out uh, into the first of next year and on out into the spring. Uh, and we'll be doing some things uh, like, like cleaning up some of the, the stuff we still have to clean up from our, our past three contingency EVAs. We got the we got the functionality recovered during those EVAs, but, but we, uh, we left some things out there that we knew that we wanted to go um, put back in proper order, so we'll do that. In addition to that, uh, we've had some failures in our power system, so we're going to go rectify that. Uh, also, we're going to take advantage while we're out on, on these EVAs to uh, improve our overall fault tolerance capability. And by that, I mean it gives us an opportunity to sustain a failure in some of these critical systems and still be able to, uh, to function and do, and do the job that, that station needs to do. So um, uh, that, that's going to be part of our near-term plan. And when you look it out a little farther as to how the EVAs uh, stack up uh, after the first of the year out into the spring, we're really going to start this, this transformation of, of the space station. We're going to be doing the things we need to do on these EVAs to, to prep um, for uh, moving, uh, moving uh, some modules around. All that is in, in preparation for being able to support some uh, future uh, uh, crewed uh, vehicles coming to station, uh, uh, commercial uh, crew vehicles. And so uh, we're trying to get out in front of that and, and do some things to put ourselves in a position to be able to do that. Uh, so we'll be prepping for moving modules. We'll be installing a new docking adapter system. Uh, so all that will be happening uh, throughout the next uh, several months on board the station as far as, as our EVA plans go. So this is going to put us in the best position that we need to be in in order to, uh, to sustain uh, the ISS and, and keep this outpost uh, functioning and, and keep it on track to be uh, a world-class laboratory that, uh, that we can use to, uh, to do research and, and discovery. Um, uh, so so that, that's our primary goal. So with that, um, ISS is in good shape, the, the crew's in good shape, the suits are in good shape, 
uh, the team's in good shape. We're ready to go do these EVAs, and I'll, uh, I'll let Scott and, and, and the folks here talk to you about the specifics. Thank you, Kenny. Um, so, folks, uh, I'm Scott Stover, lead flight director for Spacewalk 27. And as Rob said, we're here to talk about the two upcoming uh, U.S. spacewalks, uh, Spacewalks 27 and 28. Spacewalk 27 uh, is planned for October 7th. That's a Tuesday. Uh, and uh, the egress time right now is planned for about 7, 10 a.m. Central Time. Spacewalk 28 is planned for Wednesday, October 15th. And again, uh, egress is right now looking to be 7, 10 a.m. Central Time. Uh, each of the spacewalks are planned to be six and a half hours in length. Uh, both of these spacewalks will use the U.S. space suits and will uh, be egressing from the U.S. Uh, Quest airlock. For our crew members, uh, Spacewalks 27 will uh, have Reed Wiseman and Alexander Gerst as our EVA crew members. Uh, for both uh, Wiseman and Gerst, this will be the first spacewalk of their careers. Uh, however, uh, both have had hundreds of hours in training, uh, both here on the ground in the neutral buoyancy laboratory pool, uh, but also on orbit, and uh, both are ready to go uh, for the EVA. Um, our intravehicular uh, suit uh, crew member will be Barry Butch Wilmore, uh, and he will also be operating the space station robotic arm for this uh, spacewalk. Um, Alexander Gerst uh, happens to be just the third uh, German spacewalker. Uh, the first one was uh, Thomas Reiter, and the, se the second was Hans Schlegel. Um, so uh, for EVA 28, or Spacewalk 28, the uh, extravehicular crew uh, will be uh, Wiseman uh, and Wilmore. Um, so this will actually be uh, Wiseman's second uh, spacewalk, having had just completed spacewalk number 27 and it will be Wilmore's first. Um, moving on to, to give you uh, a little bit of, uh, I will be lead for spacewalk number 27, uh, and David Korth will be the lead flight director for spacewalk 28. This will be his third spacewalk as a lead flight director. And to give you an overview of spacewalk 27, we'll go through the, the objectives of the spacewalk and, and where uh, items are going to uh, happen, the actual work sites around the space station, and then uh, Jackie Kagi, our extravehicular activity officer, will go into a little bit more detail about that. So for Spacewalk 27, our primary objectives are to move uh, a degraded pump module, which is currently stowed on uh, the mobile transporter, uh, and place that on an exter external stowage platform. Uh, that pump module uh, has a failed valve in it. Uh, that failed back in December of 2013. Uh, and the pump module itself was replaced on U.S. spacewalks number 24 and 25 and was temporarily stowed uh, on the mobile transporter. So we're uh, putting it in its final stowage location. Uh, we are also going to uh, replace a camera light uh, that is uh, on the starboard side of the lab, the Destiny module. Uh, that light uh, has one of two bulbs currently failed in it, and it's one of our primary lights that we use uh, for uh, vi visiting vehicles when they arrive and also for supporting external robotics. Um, so we want to go ahead and replace that light before the second bulb fails. Uh, we will also be installing what is called the Mobile Transporter Relay Assembly. Uh, this is a, a new capability that we'll have. Uh, as, as hopefully you, you know, the, the mobile transporter is a, a vehicle that actually moves up and down the length of the space station truss and has multiple work sites that it can plug in to get power. Uh, if for some reason uh, we couldn't give power to that mobile transporter at one of those work sites, this new uh, MTRA allows us to provide keep alive power uh, and we'd be able to make sure there's no hardware damage to uh, the mobile transporter or anything attached to it. Um, when we go to look at where is all this happening, uh, luckily we're all pretty centered up in the middle of the space station. We don't have to send the EV crew members uh, far away from the airlock. The mobile transporter itself will be at worksite four, which is actually in the very center of the S0 truss. Uh, that's where uh, the degraded pump module is currently located, and we'll be moving that over to the external stowage platform number two. Uh, which is located on the starboard side of the lab, just in front of the airlock itself. Um, the camera light that we're going to be replacing is also on the starboard side of the, the lab uh, and not very far away from ESP2. 
Uh, and finally, the mobile transporter relay assembly, that is being installed up on uh, the mobile transporter once again at the center of the S0 truss. So to give you a, a quick overview of the priorities and everything for spacewalk number 28, uh, we have the, the first and most important activity we have, we're going to replace sequential shunt unit 3A. Uh, this box uh, provides regulated power from solar array number 3A. Uh, this box failed uh, back in May of 2014. Uh, it, it really is no impact to any of the downstream users of that power because uh, all of those loads have been transferred to the power channel 3 Bravo. Um, that said, by replacing uh, SSU-3A, that will allow us to have more flexibility and redundancy in the primary power system of the space station, uh, and ultimately we'll make sure that uh, we can have enough power for all the science that we want to go do. Uh, the other items that we will be performing on Spacewalk 28 are all in preparation for the relocation of the permanent multipurpose module, uh, the PMM. Uh, as Kenny mentioned, we are getting ready to do some reconfigurations of the space station in preparation for commercial crew capabilities and to uh, give us another berthing port for our commercial cargo vehicles. Um, so in order for us to be able to move the permanent uh, multipurpose module, uh, we need to relocate uh, uh, multiple components that are outside. The first one that we're going to touch is the camera port number seven. That's currently located on the P1 truss, uh, and we're going to actually not only just move this camera, uh, we're going to replace it with a new one. Uh, the current camera has a stuck zoom capability, uh, and although uh, it's usable in many ways, uh, we really do want to recover that capability. So we'll, uh, we'll be moving that camera from the bottom of the port one truss and placing it up on top of the port one truss with a, a brand new camera. Uh, we're also going to move uh, what's called an adjustable uh, portable foot restraint and tool stanchion. Uh, that also is currently located on the bottom of the Port 1 Trust, and uh, we're just going to move it out of the way uh, and place it up on the S0 Trust. Uh, and the uh, one other thing that we're going to move uh, is a wireless external television uh, camera assembly uh, or antenna assembly. Uh, that receives all of the video signals that you see from our uh, spacewalking crew members. Uh, we're going to move that from its current location on top of the Port 1 truss out and actually put it on top of the Node 2 module. Uh, again, all of this is really in preparations for uh, the permanent multipurpose module relocation, which uh, currently is scheduled sometime uh, over the summer of next year. So with that, uh, I'm going to now pass over to Jackie Keggy, who is our lead extravehicular activity officer for spacewalk number 27. Hi, I'm Jacqueline Keggy, the lead EVA spacewalk officer for US EVA 27. Um, as Scott mentioned, the spacewalk will be performed by Reed Wiseman as EV1 and Alexander Gerst as EV2, with Butch Wilmore providing our IV support and our robotic arm operations. Wiseman and Gersh have been training in a long time for this uh, EVA. We were able to prepare them in the MBL prior to launch. Uh, we did simulate this entire EVA back in March together, so um, they are ready to, to perform it next week. Uh, Wiseman will be extravehicular crew member number EV1. He will be wearing red stripes and Gerst will be crew member number two, EV2, wearing a plain white suit. They will begin the spacewalk preparations about 2.15 a.m. Central Time and scheduled to begin their in-suit light exercise or aisle pre-breathe protocol about 4.15. Aisle stands for in-suit light exercise. It's a pre-breathe protocol that we started in increment 27. Um, this protocol, we don the spacesuits and then exercise very lightly for about 15 minutes with rest breaks in between. Um, the exercise equates to just slightly moving your arms and legs to get the nitrogen out of your system. Egress from the U.S. airlock will be at 7.15 a.m. Central Time. And with that, uh, I will begin the video to fly you through the EVA. U.S. EVA 27 will start from the Quest airlock. Reed Wiseman EV1 wearing a suit with red stripes will egress first. Alexander Gerst, EV2, wearing a plain white suit, 
we'll hand out bags. And then after completing buddy checks, Alex will head to the starboard seat of cart to temp stow the MTRA bags for later use. Read will translate to ESP2 to prepare the pump module install worksite. He will temp stow bags and then open the thermal blanket to allow for the pump module installation. Meanwhile, Alex will translate to the port seat of cart to retrieve the APFR, or the Articulating Portable Foot Restraint. which he will translate to the SSRMS installation location on S0P1 interface. EV2 will install the foot restraint on the arm, swap his safety tether, and in, then ingress for his task. At this point, Reed will translate to the MTRA bags that Alex carried out. And move them to the MTRA worksite to prepare for the task later in the EVA. There are two bags. One contains the MTRA box itself, and the second bag contains the four extension cables that they will install. Then EV1 will translate to EV2's safety tether and gather it and relocate it to ESP2. Alex rides the arm, which is flown by Butch Wilmore, to the POA to retrieve the pump module. The POA is a robotically controlled stowage site that we placed the pump module on during last December's EVAs. During the arm maneuver, Alex will rotate the pump module 180 degrees to get it to the correct installation orientation. And please note that the arm maneuver shown here is greatly sped up. <laughs> Reed will help guide Butch and Alex to install the pump module partially onto ESP2. He will then remove the adjustable grapple bar or AGB from the pump module and temp stow it. and the crew will complete the final installation of the pump module. And they will use the PGT to drive the four bolts to secure it. At this point, the EV crew work together to stow the AGB on a spare ORU on ESP2. And the AGB is the method that was able to attach the pump module to the POA for that long. Reed then hands Alex his spare light bag. And while the arm flies Alex toward his next task, Reed will clean up the pump module worksite, including closing the thermal cover flap. Alex is flown to camera port 13, which is on the starboard side of the lab. He will first lock the camera pan and tilt unit and then remove the failed light. EV2 will retrieve the spare light from his MLI bag.
install it with a single bolt and the electrical connector. Alex will then retrieve the handling aid used to install the light. And then he will unlock the pan and tilt unit prior to leaving the worksite. During this time, EV1 returns the pump module bag to the airlock. and proceeds to translate to the MTRA worksite. The MTRA worksite is on the Zenith side of the MT. When Reed begin, uh, gets into position, he will remove the dead face connector that has protected the camera port uh, since 8A. Then he will install the MTRA using the PGT. Reed will gather the red yellow cable set and attach one end to the MTRA box. Then route and mate the yellow connector and continue down the port side of the MT to the Nader MT location to meet the red cable. Alex will fly back to ESP2 to clean up the SSRMS, including a safety tether swap and removal of the APFR. He then releases the SSRMS from support for the rest of the EVA. And he will translate back to the airlock to stow the failed light inside the airlock. Alex then translate to the MTRA worksite to join Reed. EV2 will work the starboard side of the MTRA where EV1 worked the port. Alex will gather the blue-green cable and meet the connectors to the MTRA. He will route the cables down the starboard side of the MT and install the green connection. And then hand off the blue connection for Reed to complete at his work site. The crew will then translate back to the Zenith side of the MT, making to sure to secure all their wire ties to keep the cables out of the MT translation path. At this point, they will clean up their bags and return to the airlock. They will ingress the airlock, completing US EVA 27 in the nominal task. Although we have not allotted for extra tasks beyond uh, the MTRA, we have prepared some in case the crew does have extra time while they're outside. These get ahead tasks uh, are called, um, these tasks are called get ahead tasks. Uh, our first two priorities would be actually two of the tasks that Keith will talk about in a couple minutes for his EVA would be trying to get some of those, that work done off of the EVA 28 before continuing uh, onto some get aheads that would uh, help reconfigure the CETA carts, deploy the MLM ethernet cable, or gather some bags that we left outside on previous EVAs. Now I'll pass over to Keith Johnson, who will talk EVA 28. Thanks, Jackie. <clears throat> um, my name is Keith Johnson. I'm the lead EVA officer for uh, US EVA 28. Um, our EV crew members um, are Reed Wiseman, repeating his role as EV1, and uh, Barry Butch Wilmore will be performing his first EVA uh, as EV2. 
Uh, Alex, in his, uh, following his role as an EV crew member, will be our ground, or our, I'm sorry, our uh, intervehicular or IV crew member where he'll help the crew get suited up in, in preparation. Um, let's see. Um, Scott mentioned that the uh, SSU 3A is our critical task on this uh, EVA. And uh, in order to change out this SSU, um, it would be receiving full power in a daylight pass of the solar array. So as an inhibit, we'll be uh, changing out that uh, during an eclipse, a night pass. Um, at this particular beta angle on October 15th, we have a little over 30 minutes to get this box uh, removed and replaced with uh, the replacement unit. Um, let's see, uh, we will be starting the EVA at about 7.20 in the morning on October 15th, and I'd like to start my video. Okay, as I mentioned, uh, Reed Wiseman will be EV1. He'll be the one with the red stripes coming out of the airlock first. He'll be followed by uh, Barry Butch Wilmore as uh, EV2. They'll hand out the spare sequential shunt unit in an orbital replacement uh, unit bag. Reed will assist Butch in translation up the CETA spur. Butch will start out first along phase one of the starboard truss. He'll drop a green hook from his safety tether bundle. Meanwhile, Reed will climb up the crew and equipment translation aid or CETA cart. He'll transfer his crew lock bag with his tools in it onto an articulating portable foot restraint, or APFR. He'll release that bundle, and he'll stow it on his body restraint tether, or BRT. Reed will join Butch along the starboard face one truss, or he'll drop his green hook, and that allows them to go farther out on the truss. Butch and Reed will continue translating uh, starboard across the solar ray alpha rotary joint out to the 3A solar array. Butch will stow the ORU bag holding the spare SSU on the S5 truss. Reed will join Butch and install the APFR with the crew lock bag in a worksite interface, or WIF socket. He'll remove the crew lock bag with the tools and stow it at the worksite. Reed will ingress the APFR in preparation for the SSU replacement task. Uh, during the day pass prior to the eclipse, he'll install a handling aid called a scoop on the failed SSU and he'll loosen the bolt in preparation for driving it all the way out. In Eclipse, he'll remove the, the failed unit, and Butch will prepare the replacement unit, hand it over to Reed. Reed will present the electrical connector side of the SSU to Butch to inspect for uh, debris, damage, bent pins, or things that could prevent it from being installed. And here's an image of uh, the business side of an SSU. Reed will rotate the SSU into position, and he'll drive the bolt while Butch monitors alignment and motion. Once the SSU is installed, the crew will notify the ground to start testing it. Reed will remove and stow the scoop and he'll hand Butch the failed SSU to put in the ORU bag. Butch will put the bag in the, S, uh, the SSU in the, the bag and put it on his BRT. Reed will egress the APFR. He'll put the crew lock bag on the APFR, put them both on his BRT. Reed and Butch will head back inboard, following the, their safety tethers back along the path they came out. They'll stop along the way to pick up the green hooks that they dropped 
on their way out, and then they'll continue inboard. Reed will stow his APFR, and he'll retrieve the crew lock bag off of it. And Butch will go to the airlock, and he'll stow the failed SSU, and he'll retrieve a small ORU bag. From there, he'll head towards camera port 7, or CP7 as we call it, on the port P1 truss. Once he's there, he'll stow his ORU bag. Meanwhile, uh, Reed will, butch, will join Butch at CP7, translating a little bit further out. And that'll help deconflict their safety tether routing. Butch will temporarily stow his small ORU bag on a local handrail. The two of them will move over to release the APFR and tool stanchion, um, and they'll shepherd it inboard. That'll get it out of the way for the permanent multi-purpose module or PMM relocation. Reed and Butch will return to CP7. Reed will remove a crew lock bag from the small ORU bag. Butch will release the bolts on the CP7 camera group. Reed will hand Butch a, a scoop, and uh, Butch will install it, and he'll remove the camera group and hand the whole thing over to Reed. From there, Reed will temporarily stow the camera group and for later retrieval. Butch and Reed will disconnect and stow three electrical connectors from the stanchion and install a small ORU bag as a handling aid. They'll release the stanchion bolt, and Reed will hand the stanchion to Butch to put on his BRT. From there, Butch will head forward on ISS to the zenith aft end of node two, where camera port 11 is located. Which will install the stanchion at CP11 and remove the ORU bag. Then he'll mate the electrical connectors. Meanwhile, Reed will translate port zenith to camera port eight, where he'll release He'll release two outer and one center bolt of the wireless video system external transceiver assembly, or WETA, and he'll install a scoop. He'll remove the whole unit and put it on his BRT. And then he'll translate out to Butch at CP11. He'll hand the Weta off to Butch. From there, Reed will retrieve the failed camera group from its uh, temporary stowage location, and it'll translate to the airlock. At the airlock, he'll exchange the failed camera group with a replacement unit in a large ORU bag.
where it'll translate back to the port truss and up to CP8, where you removed the Weta previously. He'll remove the camera group from the ORU bag. And install it on the camera stanchion. He'll remove the scoop handling aid and drive the attachment bolt. He'll check the alignment of the camera lens cover to ensure that it's square and retrieve his ORU bag and put it on his BRT. During that time, Butch will be installing the Weta on the CP11 stanchion. He'll remove the scoop, stow it in the bag, and he'll drive the center and outer bolts. Then he'll connect the electrical connectors and retrieve his ORU bag and put it on his BRT. At this point, both crew members will return to the airlock. They'll stow their bags and ingress, Butch going in first, followed by Reed. And that will complete US EVA 28. So uh, we expect uh, the EVAs to last about six and a half hours. Uh, if for some reason things go very well on US EVA 27, as Jackie mentioned, and they get several of our tasks completed early, we have a list of, of get ahead tasks that uh, we can start. Um, one of the, the tasks that we have on our list as a get ahead is releasing battery bolts on the S4 and S6 truss in preparation for those battery R&Rs um, in, in years to come. Uh, we also can retrieve the CP9 uh, light that's outside. Uh, Jackie mentioned the, uh, the bags that could be brought inside. We also have um, the MLM Ethernet cable um, routing that we could complete uh, out to, onto PMA1. Uh, we also have the seat of cart reconfigurations as part of our get ahead list and an airlock handrail clamp to cover up an MMO D strike. And that's all I have. Okay, thanks, Keith. Uh, time for questions, and we'll take them here at JSC and on our phone bridge. And we'll start off over here with Mark Carreau. Mark? Uh, thank you, uh, Mark Carreau, for Aviation Week. I had a question and a follow-up. I wonder if you might uh, go back to the battery fuse issue that sort of forced the delay and, uh, from resuming the maintenance spacewalks in, in August. Yeah, I guess where I'm going with that is to, to understand if that was a generic problem or, or what, you know, what you needed to do to resolve that, how it arose, and then I have a follow-up. Well, let's see. The, uh, the issue was with our, our long-life batteries. Um, there was a discovery that was made um, when, when looking back at the testing and the way the batteries were tested. Uh, that uh, generically, anytime you, you uh, get ready to fly a set of batteries, we go through what we call a series of acceptance tests for those batteries. And uh, we put them through a number of, of different cycles. And for the batteries, um, they discovered some on the ground here in their testing that their test plan called out more cycles than, uh, than what was required. And so um, at the time, uh, we looked at it hard and said, uh, you know, do we want to continue? With the batteries we have on board, uh, we felt like they were good batteries. We felt like if we needed to go out in a contingency that, that we could do that. Um, there was no indications. The batteries were charging. They were just fine. Um, but, uh, but, but the fact of the matter is that the, uh, the test plan that, that they had been through was not consistent with what the original intent was, which was not to put them through as many cycles. And so, so we made the decision. We knew it was conservative when we made it, but we thought it was a, a good call. We could wait on the EVAs. It wasn't an issue there. And so, uh, so again, we, we made the decision to uh, fly up some new batteries um, and, uh, and get those on board and then, and then uh, get ourselves in a, uh, you know, what we consider to be as pristine a shape as we could going into these EVAs. Thanks, and for my follow-up, I wondered if you will continue to 
use the uh, absorbent pads and the, um, the breathing tubes uh, that you used after the uh, July uh, 2013 difficulties, or is that no longer necessary? Those are, for now, I mean, those are a standard part of our, our gear going forward. Um, again, uh, coming out of, out of the, uh, the issue that we had with, with Luca back in 2013, we made a, a lot of different changes um, to, to minimize the overall risk. And, and part of that was things that we could do to, to reduce the likelihood of, of having the problem, but also to, to, to also reduce the consequence and, and, and mitigate the consequence part of it too. And, and as part of that, uh, the actions with, with having the snorkel and the, the helmet pad and so forth really, really helps us from, from the standpoint of mitigating a, a consequence should we get there uh, again. So, so yeah, that's going to be a standard part of, of, our, uh, of our preparations from, from this point forward. Robert? Robert Perlman with CollectSpace.com. Um, Keith, you mentioned uh, a list of five different uh, get-aheads at the end. I'm wondering, in general, how, with, with the delay that were paused that we had in, in spacewalks, how long the list of get-aheads uh, or tasks that are not critical has grown, and um, and how you rank what to do next in that list? That's an interesting question. Uh, the the list is long. Um, it includes things that at the very bottom of the list that are probably trivial, but you know would would be nice to just, just to to neaten up all the way up to um, tasks that would help future EVAs um, by you know getting steps out of the way or or clearing a path. So um, I, I would have to get you the information on on how many items are on that list, but. Uh, we, we try to work them in priority order, but we also try to work them um, uh, based on the location of the crew members uh, throughout the, the existing EVA, uh, what ones would work best. So um, we, we have a prioritized list of, of things that have to happen, probably more based on, uh, on, on criticality of, of future failures or, or things that would help us get ahead all the way down. So, um, you know, we, we I wouldn't say pick and choose. We're given a list that gets approved, that gets uh, analyzed for the work sites that we're at, and um, we try to get as many of those done as we can. Thanks. Hey, uh, we have uh, one reporter on the phone bridge. We'll come back here for follow-ups as well. Uh, Miriam Kramer, Space.com. You there? Hi. Yeah. Thanks so much for taking my question. Um, so I, I am curious about how the spacewalk pairs were decided and also how the um, tasks of each of the spacewalkers uh, are, are chosen. I mean, like, for instance, uh, Gert gets to ride the robotic arm. So how, I, I guess I'm wondering how, how all of that is, is kind of decided. Um, thanks. Uh, so uh, I guess I'll take that one, uh, and Jackie and Keith can chime in at any point in time also. Uh, for, for an overall, what tasks are selected? Um, it, there's multiple things that go into consideration. As Keith even mentioned with the get-ahead task, um, primary tasks for any uh, spacewalk uh, come from a programmatic standpoint. There are priorities of items that we need to get done uh, external to the vehicle. Um, some of those could actually be uh, completed by uh, the SPDM and robotics, so uh, we will try to make sure that those ha get handled uh, from, from a robotic standpoint. But there are just some items that uh, you know, need a, a crew member's touch uh, outside, uh, and so from a, an overall programmatic side, whether it's uh, because a failure has happened and we need to respond to that failure, or uh, it's preparation for future activities, uh, for example, the PMM relocation, uh, the, the program gives, gives us a prioritized list of those items that need to be done. Um, we then generically plan our spacewalks for six and a half hours, so we need to, to analyze and figure out how, how long each one of those activities uh, will last, and, and it's kind of like a puzzle at that point in time where you're, you're putting the pieces together. Uh, this item takes 20 minutes, this item takes two hours, and you have to come up with timelines that are about six and a half hours long. Um, as for which crew member uh, gets to do which, that's almost a puzzle as well. Uh, so uh, each crew member is trained, uh, and, and they get trained on many activities. Uh, specifically, our, our contingency 
uh, failure response activities, all the crew members uh, on the uh, U.S. segment get trained on those so that they can respond uh, if we need them. Uh, but for planned EVAs, uh, there, there's uh, you know assessments of crew members' capabilities. Uh, all of our guys are, and girls are very sharp, but uh, you know whether it's crew member size or anything like that, we uh, we need to take that in consideration when it, it comes down to performing an activity. Uh, so that that kind of gets put into place, uh, and then when you look at um, what tasks need to be done, it, it, like I said, it kind of lays out as a puzzle as well as to which crew member is available at any time and uh, which uh, tasks best fit that person. Um, so yeah, it looks fun because uh, Mr. Gers gets to ride the arm around and it could be fun, but uh, uh, he, uh, you know, Reed could do just the, the, the same job and it, it was determined um, what best fit each of those crew members. Okay, I think that was it from Miriam. Back here at JSC, any follow-ups? Mark? Yes, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, if we dial back again um, to July of uh, 2013 and, and the whole broad issue of um, uh, conducting spacewalks, is there any way to sort of ad address the, the sort of overall change or improvement in, or rigor in conducting spacewalks now, whether they're emergency or maintenance? Um, has this whole process put you in a, in a, in a better position? I, I assume it has, but I, I just don't know how you look at it from a management standpoint. Well, part of the, 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 the issue of recovering from, the, recovering from the actual um, issue itself, there was a mishap investigation board that was formed to, to look at all facets, not just the, the technical part of what happened, but also look at, at the management aspects, cultural aspects, what have you, to try to, try to see where there, where there are gaps in, in the way that we prepared for EVAs on, on all fronts. And so um, coming out of that, there was a series of recommendations that were, were made. Um, there was an EVA recovery team that was put in place to go and, and work all of those recommendations. Um, so when you look back at, at uh, where we were then going into EVAs and our prep level of preparation now, uh, I would tell you that uh, I think we're, we're communicating better. I think the teams uh, uh, working the suits and working with the program and working with our ops community, I think there's a lot, lot tighter um, coordination that's happening about issues with suits and, and how that flows into operations and how we make management decisions. So, so uh, I think there is, uh, a certain level of awareness um, across the community now that that uh, um, that, that is enhanced that that's been put in place and that that uh, through our review process and and just our basic communications is much much better than it used to be. Robert, um, sort of the flip side of get aheads. Um, it was mentioned that uh, all three are, are rookie spacewalkers and that they're well trained, that they've gone through um, uh, the pool and such. But um, is there any time loaded at the front to give to let them sort of gain their their space legs, so to speak, um, and to just get familiar working in the EMU in the vacuum of outer space? Yeah, for, for every uh, first-time spacewalker, we do uh, put about uh, 15 to 20 minutes at the beginning uh, just after egress that we call translation adaptation, and we give them some uh, points and tips of uh, different movements to make just so they can get used to the feel of themselves in the suit in the vacuum of space for the first time. And then we also pad our EVAs for all crew members because it is different than what we do in the, the water so that we have plenty of time so we're not rushing the crew members when they're out the door. I'd also like to add that uh, during US EVA 28, we are shooting for a specific eclipse to start the SSU task. And as part of that, we take into account that we have one rookie and uh, the other crew member will have completed, Reed will have completed a, an EVA the week before. So we'll use that to, to judge well, what it takes to get them out to the work site. But uh, we leave enough margin so that they should be there and set up at the work site ahead of time. Any other follow-ups here? Okay, I think that's it for questions. We'll close uh, the briefing with a programming note. 
our spacewalk coverage on NASA television next Tuesday, October 7th, as well as on October 15th. We'll begin at 6 a.m. Central Time, 7 a.m. Eastern Time, the beginning of a busy several months aboard the International Space Station. You can follow all of the ISS activities every day on our website at www.nasa.gov station. With that, we'll sign off for today, and we'll be back and see you next week. Thanks very much.